These people are very rare. They have always been there and always will be. They live on different continents and pray to different gods. But they all have abilities that are beyond explanation. Their words are prophetic. Their undertakings sometimes contradict the laws of physics. Our project is about them, the mysterious chosen ones, the people of knowledge. This is Kandy, the ancient capital of the Kingdom of Kandy, known today as Sri Lanka. For centuries, pilgrims and devotees have been coming here from all over the world. The Great Kingdom ceased to exist 200 years ago with the British Empire making Ceylon its colony. At the same time, Kandy had lost its status as a capital city, but not its pilgrims. Today, same as ever, they want to get inside this Snow White temple. For many centuries, it has been home to the most important relic for all Buddhists. Hidden in seven caskets behind the temple walls is the Tooth of the Buddha. But under the cover of darkness, local villagers worship other powers much more ancient than Buddha. His statue is standing on top of a hill that used to belong to someone else, a demon called Barava. Local exorcists, Katadiya, dedicate their shocking ceremonies to this demon and his 18 associates. And that has nothing to do with the peaceful teachings of Buddha. The surroundings of the demonic Bahira Wakanda hill don't stand out much from the adjacent districts of the central province. Same tea plantations, same rice fields, same humble farmer huts. Only it's here that you find a widely spread belief in 18 demons that cause 18 human ailments. One of the demons is responsible for a runny nose, another for cholera, the third one for vomiting, the fourth one makes people paralyzed. Fifty-two-year-old Kuzum Mwati fell victim to several demons at once. At least that's what everyone thinks, including her own brother, Chandrasena, who has noticed some odd changes in Kusumu's behavior three months ago. At some point, she stopped paying attention to what was happening around, as if temporarily losing touch with reality. Just like now. Okay then, I'm going to milk the cow. Are you coming with me? Chandra Siena walks away without waiting for his sister to reply, but he cannot live with the thought that she has been captured by dark forces. He keeps trying to remember when it all started. Three years ago, her husband suddenly died. 
Nobody knows why. He was very strong, a field worker. My sister, on the other hand, was taking care of the household. When she lost him, her life energy started fading away. The mourning period is over, but she keeps getting worse. She gets headaches and never stops daydreaming. She doesn't talk to people anymore, even to me. She simply retreated into herself. Being the elder brother, Chandrasena is helping out his sister. Not only he comes here every day to milk the cow, but he also has taken upon himself all the household chores. The devastated widow has children, but they have moved out of Kandy and into the capital a long time ago, now living their own lives. <laughs> The simple lifestyle of this isolated dwelling is dragging the woman out of the real life. Everything her now dead husband once touched reminds her that her life is ruined. Time couldn't hear her sorrow, and she still misses the man she had been married to for almost 30 years. On the contrary, she seems to only be getting worse. The deceased man comes to visit her, not only in her dreams, but also in reality. Kusuma does not want to make any changes. She keeps her husband's toothbrush in its place, continues to wash his clothes, and always has his cup at hand. It's as if Kusuma is waiting for her husband to come back any time now. I think she is troubled by a peta. That's how we call the ghost of a dead person. He doesn't let her go. She is almost possessed by him. She doesn't want to live in the present. It's not just sadness. It's more dangerous than that. She even refuses to milk her cow, saying that she cannot get close to the animal ever since her husband died. But Eladena feels everything. Eladena is the cow. She is not just a source of food. She is venerated here as a goddess that brings wealth and abundance to people. If a sacred cow doesn't let someone get close to her, villagers of Kandy province conclude without a second thought. The cow is afraid of dark spirits following that person. She would never tolerate a touch from someone with demons inside. I think this is all because of demons. I should probably go through the Tobol ritual to get rid of them. Many people advise me to do that, otherwise I might get even worse. It's difficult to believe that this devastated widow with listless eyes once upon a time was a cheerful woman. Busy as a bee, she was always taking care of something. She liked noisy celebrations and merry gatherings. To describe her, people would say, first we would hear laughter, and there comes our Kusumawari. This house used to be full of joy. Why aren't you eating yourself? I just have no appetite. I've been feeling so nauseous lately, and these headaches. I cannot get my thoughts straight. I'm barely walking. These women are Kusumawadi's best friends. They've been visiting her every Saturday since her husband died, on successfully trying to convince her to go to church. You don't look so well. I keep telling you, go to the temple. You might feel better. Tomorrow is Sunday of all days, and you haven't been there for a while. But the brother, who remained silent almost the entire conversation, later admits that before visiting a temple, Kusumawadi has to undergo an exorcism. Demons are the ones taking away her will to go to places and do things. I'm telling you, there's a reason behind this. She has never been like that. She used to go to the temple regularly, but now a bit of walking and receiving a couple of guests wear her off completely. And that's exactly what happens on this occasion too. As soon as her friends leave, Sumawadi goes to bed. Completely exhausted, she drifts away, 
thinking about her husband. It is as if her whole life is now left in the past. What you have just witnessed is her normal state, and it's no surprise that she's not embarrassed by it. She just doesn't care, but I do. I need my Kusumuwati back. Since ancient times, saving people who are possessed by demons has been a responsibility of Katadia, a special case of priests. According to local beliefs, they communicate directly to the spirits of the earth and therefore have to work on land. Gudenlaki is one of them, an ordinary farmer cultivating rice. You are early today, Gunatile. Why can't you just stay at home? The entire field is flooded. Or is it more refreshing for you? <laughs> I'm just so old now, neighbor. Working the heat is not for me anymore. <laughs> you old? That's ridiculous. You don't seem to lack energy when you chase demons all night long. I'm surprised you are working at all after that. <laughs> That's why I come here. The land helps me to recover my strength. A bit of hoeing and it all goes away. No more dark thoughts. After making a bit of small talk, the farmers immerse themselves in their work and start singing. This is their morning mantra. It praises the return of the gods to earth after a night of demons running wild, who locals believe have power at night. Every morning, Kathadiya's wife reads a special mantra to her grandson. It's supposed to protect the child from the dangerous occupation of his grandpa. We've been together with Kunatilaki for 40 years. Many things happen. You know, it's not easy to be him. Sometimes he comes home completely wiped out, and he just wants to stay alone in his room. And that's exactly what happens this time. After changing his clothes, this humble priest of peasant blood seeks to retire to his chambers. Still, on his way, he doesn't miss a chance to pet his grandchild, his big hope. My profession, if you can call it that, was passed on to me by my father, and he got it from my grandpa. And according to the legend, it goes back all the way to seven wise men that came to Sri Lanka many thousand years ago from northern India. They were calling themselves Katadiya, sacred dancers, summoned here by one of our kings. He was seriously ill, and Katadiya performed a special exercising ceremony for him that lasted throughout day and night. Since that time, this knowledge has been passed on from one generation to the other, and I will pass it on to my grandson, as once I did to his father. Some of this knowledge is stored here in a common cabinet with piles of manuscripts, each more than a century old. This is my family library. To be honest, I don't know how old these manuscripts are, but I do know what's written in every one of them. These texts are sacred to me. I doubt anyone except for me can understand anything here because they are written in ancient Sinhalese. This material is coconut paper. I'm not afraid to show it to you because you wouldn't understand anything anyway. Next, the priest takes one of the manuscripts and starts reading evening prayers. When I just met my husband, I didn't know what to make of his gift. 
He might seem very powerful on the outside, but he still is ready to help anyone on a moment's notice. Perhaps that's why the Sumawati's brother chooses to call him of all the Katadiya when the poor woman's condition starts to deteriorate. Hello. 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 Gunati Lake. Can you hear me? This is Chandra Sena, Kusumuwati's brother. You know, she just went from bad to worse. I don't know what to do. This insomnia is killing her. Could you maybe come over? We'll be waiting. This night is especially hard on Kusumawati. Merciless insomnia grabbed her and won't let her go. Anguish is building up like a snowball. The telephone is silent. She is left one-on-one -on -one with her despair. As usual at this hour, the widow is listening to the crackling of the fire. The fireplace seems to protect her house from the horrors lurking behind the window. It feels like if the fire dies out, darkness will engulf everything. Only a half hour later, Guntalaki arrives to the house of the sick woman. He walks straight into the room that became so familiar to him in the last three months. How are you? Your brother called. He said demons are giving you a bad time. Yes, teacher. Forgive me, I can't even greet you properly. You've really let yourself go. It's not good to stay in bed for so long. You have to drink more water, even if you don't want to. You also need milk. Your joints lack calcium. Your headaches and insomnia are caused by demons, though. I think it's the work of Buhuvati and Peta spirits. But we can only know it for sure after performing Tovil. And it wouldn't hurt to go to church first. I am very hopeful. I would pay any money for that. And I trust this priest. He has helped many people. The next morning, Kusumawati puts together some offerings and goes to a Buddhist temple several kilometers from her home. She's accompanied by her friends, the same ones who were convincing her yesterday to join them for service. After a short greeting, the woman and the abbot enter the temple for praying, joined by the students of a Buddhist school. Meanwhile, the preparations for Tovo are well underway in the Pagan Sanctuary. Together with his assistants, Sandra Sena has to build a small temple and stretch a trampoline over the main area to make sure that unexpected rain does not ruin the ceremony. It's too slack, don't you think? Yeah, I think we need to tighten it. If the rain would flow down the roof, the water might start building up there. Let's tighten it. Do we have more rope? Say again? I said, do we have more rope? Yes, I'm getting it now. 
We are going to fix it. Relax. One of the essential elements of the upcoming ritual is a sacrifice of the black chicken. Black chicken is a traditional offering to several demons at the same time, including Buhuvati and Peta, who are haunting my patient. The sacrifice we made here late at night. It's a time when the moon rises and the border between the spirit world and the mortal world is at its thinnest. But nowadays, it's not as bloody as it used to be when sacrificing the bird to evil powers meant you have to feed the altar with its blood. Now everything is a bit different. Just wait, you're going to see it for yourself. We shouldn't talk much about it now, otherwise spirits would get hungry too early. One more participant appears on the construction site. Buntalaki's son. He plays his own part in the ceremony preparations, being in charge of the sacred fire and the altar for celebrating demons and the gods. Bilbil's ceremony is one of the most difficult and complicated. Usually a lot of people come to watch it, and a lot of people are involved in its preparation. Every person is in charge of his own piece of work to make sure everything is done in time. That's why we have well-defined areas of responsibility, even me and my father. While I'm taking care of the altar, he is preparing the special offerings to be given to our gods and spirits after midnight. Every decoration is a true piece of art. A colossal amount of work for a single ceremony. Everything here is made of wood and palm leaves, like this offering for Bakirava demon. We will try to distract and fool him, and then take it out the patient's body and carry its invisible spirit to a cemetery where his fellow demons live. The second offering is for various gods and Buddha, directed to the four corners of the world. It is hard to grasp how local priests managed to keep track of hundreds of deities and spirits that came here from a number of religious teachings. But local peasants treat and worship them equally. And the ritual that is going to be performed on the pagan altar after sunset is not any way preventing Kusumawadi and her friends from dropping by a Buddhist temple. There is nothing confusing for these women in worshiping Buddha, Siva, and local spirits all at once. And hardly anyone thinks of the differences between their gods or comprehends the roots of various teachings. Usually I pray to Buddha and our gods, patrons of our land. I ask them for protection from evil spirits and demons who often come to possess people. Nobody can fight them on his own, me included. That's why I try and go to church, although I often feel weak. They take everything from me. I hope Tovo will help me. As the night falls on the Kandy province, Kusumawadi leaves her home. Her cow draws a long moo, as if knowing that no matter what the outcome of the ceremony, her owner will never be the same. The tradition forbids Kusumawadi from coming to the Tobu alone. She's going to pick up a helper on her way who will accompany the woman throughout the ceremony.
The Tovo ceremony starts after dark, when street lamps and torches are lighting up everywhere. One of these dots stands for the fires at the shrine, which at nightfall has assumed a truly mystical look. Natalaki is drawing some obscure lines that look like pentagrams. These inscriptions have magical protective properties, and the priest is trying to explain their meaning to his favorite student, his five-year-old grandson. The boy froze, closely watching Grandpa's every move. See, boy? This is a cage for the evil demon Bakirava. At night, he comes to steal our souls. If you don't get him under control, you might end up paying with your health. This drawing is special. You can even say magical. It's going to trap the evil demon. As soon as he comes out at night, we will put him into this vessel, and this drawing will keep him inside. Then we will take it to a cemetery. Sinahali's folklore is full of dark plots, so horror stories about evil spirits are not enough to scare local children, especially if it's a grandson of a Katadiya priest specializing in exorcisms. According to the schedule on the wall, the ceremony will continue from 8 p.m. to 4 in the morning, but in reality, the course of the ritual depends on how powerful the demons are, which is impossible to predict. Before the start of the ceremony, the priest's son puts on a special suit of armor. It prevents the demons of the sick woman from penetrating the body of the healer himself. The next step is tuning the ritual drums, the sound of which will accompany the summoning of the demons. The beginning of the ritual is heralded by a trumpeting seashell, a call for gods to help Gunatilaki. The same sound served as a start signal, not only for the crowd of onlookers, but for the sick woman herself. As the dark sets in, the woman of the night finally arrives to the tovo. Everyone feels excitement. She has been long awaited for. Accompanying the widow is a priest's wife, her job is to provide moral support to Kusumawadi throughout the ceremony. She will not leave the sick woman's side the whole time. After all, anything can happen. Sometimes, on approaching the temple, a woman would start growling, struggling, and trying to escape in the darkness, driven by her demons. It's simply impossible to predict how a person will behave in the situation. It's probably for this reason that the priest's wife has both of her hands on the sick woman the whole walk towards the shrine. With the growing drum beat, the ceremony begins. Getting even one element of the ritual wrong might scare or anger the demons. That's why calling for spirits from beyond, priest Gunatelaki sets the rhythm of every tune himself. The first breakthrough happens about a half an hour after the beginning. Kusumawati suddenly breaks into tears. Katadiya's son keeps reading the mantra to make the evil spirits let go of the woman and leave her body. 
This is basically an exorcism. Only the priest is talking to Buddha and Siva the Destroyer, asking them to favor the sick woman and give her enough strength to rid of the demons herself. There is a reason for why a white shroud was put on the woman's shoulders in the very beginning of the ceremony. It is a symbol of a clean soul, soon to be liberated from dark powers. Such a performance is not a common sight. Being one of the most venerated ceremonies, the tovel always ignites a lot of curiosity mixed with fear. It is believed that healing is more likely to occur when many people are present. For farmers living below the poverty line, pagan rituals substitute traditional medicine, which is out of reach for most of them. Medications are expensive, doctors are few, and even those who are accessible don't command the same level of respect as the Katadia priests with their efficient and somewhat shocking ceremonies. Somehow, all these flashes of fire, incantations, and rumbling drums cannot stop babies from having a nap. Like this little boy who fell asleep right on the shoulder of his mom. For him, this whole event is nothing more than a fairy tale, with the priest as its main character. And while everyone else is waiting for demons to appear, the boy is smiling to his innocent and careless dreams. Everyone present at today's ceremony believes what happened to the poor widow can one day happen to them too. As priests say, demons attack people in the moments of despair. According to local beliefs, a sad person is helpless and presents an easy prey for evil spirits. Cleansing continues with yet another incantation. There are several steps to the process. Seven symbolical lines are yet to be crossed. The scorching fire does not allow demons to feel at home in the widow's body. They start trying to break free. As a sort of antiseptic against evil, the priest uses lemon. With special ceremonial pliers, he is snatching invisible demons out of the woman's head. Those who have been causing her headaches and insomnia and then again and again, seven times in total. The ritual enters its second stage. Kusumawadi is approaching the altar that was built just for her. Her brother is watching her with apprehension. It's time for the scariest and most terrifying ritual, a conversation with demons. Mediating this conversation is priest assistant, Ekedira. In Sinhalese, it means she who talks to demons. Communicating with evil powers is a woman-only job. According to local superstitions, dark energy comes into the world of humans, using women as conductors. As for the Katadia priest, he sets the mood for the conversation with the world of beyond with a ritual drum beat. His son joins him and starts singing a special mantra for the demon to come out. who talks to demons is swaying to the drum rhythm until she finally reaches an ecstatic state. She is trying to make contact with the other world and it seems successful. Idle onlookers are especially impressed when she who talks falls down on the ground and starts laughing and screaming with an alien voice.
If this is just part of the show, aimed at suggestible peasants who believe in spirits, you can only admire the commitment, or rather, become scared of it. Even the expression on Kusumawadi's face changes. Even the loud rumble of the drums cannot silence the ominous hiss when she who talks to demons puts out the torch with her tongue. Finally, the senior priest interrupts the frenzy and orders the demon to leave. As the incantation is truly ancient, we can only provide you with a partial translation. The priest couldn't translate it completely into a modern language. What do you need from this poor woman, O oh, Bahira Wakanda demon? I order you in the name of Buddha, Guatama, and all other gods, in the names of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the destroyer, and Shiva, the creator. Yaka demons, take all you want and all you need in your fire. Spare this earthly child. Don't let the spirit of her dead husband seize her mind with the thoughts of a departed soul. The woman utters something incoherent in reply. The priest announces the demands of the demons. As usual, they want to make a deal. Demons of the Bahirava Hill will spare this child if we give a blood offering to the spirits of the earth. We need to make the sacrifice in their abode like it has been done by our ancestors. In the place where a troubling spirit cannot fall asleep and keeps this poor woman awake at night. Let us all pray together and do what spirits ask and then go home in peace. Upon saying these words, the priest steps into the shadows, giving the floor to his son. Yet again, the sun is celebrating gods and demons that were kind enough to reply. A black chicken and a coconut are brought to the altar. The ritual dance with a sword represents the upcoming sacrifice. Just a few drops of blood are enough to appease the spirits. The priest's son carefully draws them from a bird's wing and carries them over to the altar. However, the misery of the feathery victim is not over yet. Gunalaki and his assistant, she who talks to demons, have one more bizarre ritual to perform. <laughs> As it turns out, that was not the most ominous part of the ceremony. Around two past midnight, the Cathedia priest signals that it's time to perform a symbolical funeral of the demon on a not so symbolical cemetery. Attendance of this rather creepy procession is men only. Women and children are left behind at the shrine. And Kasumawati is among them, on the verge of fainting. No wonder, the ceremony has been going on for six hours already.
Meanwhile, in the cemetery, the Kathadiya priest lies down on a grave. It has been prepared beforehand to trap the evil demon. The Kathadiya utters an incantation like mantra. The surreal and menacing ceremony uncovers a truly dark side of Sri Lanka's life and paganism that is alive and well, even in the 21st century. The next morning, the village wakes up as if nothing happened. The Katadiya priest goes into the field again. It's almost as like those terrible hours at the cemetery and the frenzy at the pagan altar were just a dream. Things go back to the way that they were, in full compliance with the law of Samasara, the ever-continuing chain of rebirth and death, embraced by the people of Kandy. It's not only about magic. It's about the attitude of a person. It's not up to me to believe or not. I don't know what it is. I simply do what my ancestors had been doing and what my descendants will also continue to do. Our power will not go anywhere as long as people believe in us. There is some evidence that every second inhabitant of the Kandy province seeks help from a local priest. All of them are absolutely sure that they feel the healing effect of ominous rituals. The meeting with the priest might have changed something in Kasumawati's life. At least the sacred cow is no longer avoiding her like the plague. I cannot exactly explain how Tomo works. You know, it's like a load has been lifted off my chest. The darkness went away and the fear went with it. I'm not afraid anymore, and I have a desire to live again. Here, these things are not subject to doubt. Such is the invisible world in the vicinity of Bihirawakanda Hill where priests overcome their fear of the unknown world of the human soul and believe in the 18 demons on par with Buddha. In the shadow of the village temple, one more woman, possessed by demons from the past, seems to be finding again the present meaning of her life with the help of the Kathadiya. Sri Lankan people of power, 